wired up here. I hope I get the right switch and don't put it on mute. But uh, my girls uh, going to Cuba is uh, kind of nerve-wracking. We have to trust the Lord when they go. Their uh, ministry team has actually had a ministry to uh, high officials in the government there, which we are very thankful for. Um, so you, if you will, be in prayer for, for that uh, group of folks that uh, they will be able to see some folks um, in high places um, come to know the Lord as their Savior. Well, I wanted to start this morning getting myself in the, in the frame of mind that I think we should have as Christians at this particular season of the year um, concerning the birth of our Lord. It's been said that the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem was an event of more historical significance than any other single event in history. Several years ago, a number of years ago, Dr. James Kennedy wrote a book titled, What If Jesus Had Never Been Born? And in that book, he documents many remarkable changes to our world that occurred as a direct result of our Lord's coming into the world. So this morning, I'd like to for us just to briefly, you know that word means nothing, survey the mystery, <laughs> survey the Christmas story, and just get our minds back on the Christmas story. So if you'd turn to Luke chapter 2 with me, and uh, we'll look at these verses, and uh, trust the Lord will bless our opening of his word this morning. We're beginning chronologically, and that is with the first announcement of our Lord's birth to the shepherds. Uh, and we read in chapter 2, verse 1, Now, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of the inhabited world. <clears throat> now, Caesar and Augustus uh, is a connection that we have to history. He was an adopted son of Julius Caesar, another connection to the Christmas story. His title was Augustus, which means the exalted one. His name was Gaius Octavian Caesar. Um, he was the one, of course, who defeated Queen Cleopatra, better known as Elizabeth Taylor, and Mark Anthony. <laughs> better known to some of us old people as Richard Burton, um, in the Battle of Actium. That was a movie back in 63 for you youngins. <laughs> Verse 2 says, even more, this was the first census taken, and other translations say taxation. It was a census for taxation, and the word is better translated census, many believe, so it was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now there's some confusion about the dates and times here, but it can all be uh, explained in a way that's understandable, but it goes into much deeper detail than I'm willing to go into this morning. So you'll have to do that on your own. Verse 3, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. This meant that Joseph and Mary, who were in Galilee uh, and Nazareth, would have to travel some 90 miles south uh, to, Jerusalem, to Bethlehem to be registered because that was the hometown of their ancestors. So Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. And notice it says he went up. Now he's going south. So how is that? You know, when we go south, it's going down, right? When we go north, it's going up. But in Israel, Jerusalem is up. It's 2,474 feet up. It's higher than any other place 
topographically in the whole land. And so from any direction, you're going up. Not only that, but in the mind of the Jewish people, it was the place where God lived, where God dwelt in the temple. And so it was spiritually up in their mind. And so the writer of scripture says that Joseph and Mary went up to Jerusalem, traveling south, they went up. And he was with his espoused wife, the King James says, or engaged wife. Actually, if you think about this, this was a, a Jewish marriage. They were uh, marriages that were arranged so uh, in a sense of being engaged and legally married, they kind of mesh here. She was his legal wife, and she was expecting her first child, according to these verses. So verse 5 says, and I think the scripture is what we want to we wanna take into account. It's not what we say about the scripture, but it's what the scripture says. And if we can understand it, uh, a little bit more clearly after 1400 years or whatever it is uh, in the language of the people, then that's what we don't want to do. So in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child, she was expecting her due date was almost there, if you can imagine. And the Bible says nothing about her riding a donkey to Jerusalem, by the way. She would have had the baby halfway there, I'm thinking. <laughs> I don't really know. But uh, it was a 90-mile walk or a 90-mile trip, however they went. In verse 6, well, it says, while they were there, her due date came. That's my language. The days were completed for her to give birth. And verse 7 says, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. What does firstborn indicate? There were more to come. And in fact, if we look at our Bibles, we find in Mark 6 and Matthew 13 that the names of Jesus' brothers are listed and sisters. The sisters aren't listed because in that day, the, the men were, were the important ones. And so Joseph Jr. is one of Je Jesus' brothers. Um, Simon was another of his brothers. James was another, and Jude was another. They're all listed there. By the way, they all thought he was crazy, and they wanted to commit him. Did you know the Bible says that? They wanted to have him committed to some kind of place where he might get help. And of course, things changed after the resurrection. So in seven, this is her firstborn, and she wrapped him. By the way, that means there's no perpetual virginity. Have you heard of that doctrine uh, of the Roman Catholic Church? Uh, that didn't happen. She had a number of children after the Lord Jesus. And she wrapped him in swaddling clothes. This is important. Swaddling clothes were long strips of cloth that they used for burial, for mummifying. They were like 18 feet long and four or five inches wide that they wrapped the baby tightly to keep it from scratching its tender skin, scratching its eyes. There are so many benefits from swaddling, I understand. This is still done in many parts of the world, in the Middle East, in Russia, uh, in our Indian culture. Uh, this is still done swaddling. And they've studied this, and there are some good benefits from this and some negatives. So if you ever decide to do that with the next one coming up, by the way, one of my grandsons was swaddled. Um, then you have to know the rules. There are definitely rules for swaddling. And it is said that uh, this prevents SIDS. That's a possibility, a good thing. So here we are, swaddling this baby in swaddling clothes and um, laying him in a manger. Now, what is a manger? Um, Maybe we'll see a picture of a manger here. It's a Greek word, phaetine, or fatni. It comes from the word food in Greek. This was a food trough for animals. It was either wooden or carved out of stone. This is a picture of one. This is what our Lord was laid in after his birth. This was a sign, the scripture says that he's wrapped in swaddling clothes and he's laid in a food trough for animals. 
Now, you know, if you think of anything about where a food trough for animals is, and I'm not a farmer, but this is the way I think, it must have been a stinky place with flies and feces and all those kind of things. I talked to a friend of mine last night, last evening, and, and he said, no, a lot of times corrals are very clean, and especially in Europe where they keep animals practically in the house with them in the winter, and they keep them clean. Well, maybe so, maybe not. In my own thinking, it was part of our Lord's humiliation. He made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Uh, for you know uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might be made rich with God. And so in taking on humanity, that was humiliation or not enough. But in becoming an infant in a stable, that was even much worse. Now notice this manger. Uh, there wasn't an inn, by the way. There wasn't a, a, a Hilton Holiday Inn or anything like that in Bethlehem at that time. By the way, they do have them today. But this was not an inn. In fact, the word inn in this verse is katalumai, and it means a corral. See, that's all that was left in Jerusalem for anyone to stay in, where they put their animals. And in that corral, there was a lean-to, perhaps, or maybe a, some kind of a structure there, but it was full up. So there was nothing for the Lord Jesus, nowhere for him to be born. And so tradition says that he was born in a cave. Now, you might put a cave up there. Uh, there's a cave, and, and this cave is said to be found uh, under the, uh, the church in Bethlehem, the church of the nativity. And by the way, Sue and I have been there. It's a very interesting place. And it's been traditionally claimed to have been the birthplace of our Lord for time immemorial, from the very beginning. Uh, it has been, there have been wars fought over that cave. It is presumed that this cave was the cave that the Lord Jesus was born in. I'm getting way ahead of myself. Uh, but most scholars do believe that it was a limestone cave. Here's a picture of the, the Church of the Nativity, the foundation of it, and the, um, the cave under the church in red. It's, a, it's an interesting place. Helena, uh, Constantine's mother, was the first to build a church over it. When the uh, Persians came through, uh, they did not destroy the church because it had a, a fresco of the wise men in Persian dress. And so they didn't destroy it. But the cults, uh, destroyed it and desecrated it often because they knew it was a Christian symbol and a Christian place of worship. So this is what we see. There are caves around Bethlehem today where shepherds keep their sheep. And by the way, they keep them spring, summer, and winter in the fields in and around Bethlehem because there's always need in our Lord's day of sacrifice. There was always need of lambs, and any lamb, in fact, I, I should read this to you. Um, a great scholar, if you want to read a good commentary, Leon Morris. Leon Morris is an excellent scholar, and this is what he wrote. It is not unlikely that these shepherds were pasturing flocks destined for the temple sacrifices. Flocks were supposed to be kept in the wilderness, Mishnah, Baba, Kama, 7, verse 7, Talmud, and Baba, Kama, 7, 96, 80, because I know you're going to look these up. And the rabbi's rule also provides that any animal found between Jerusalem and a spot near Bethlehem must be presumed to be a sacrificial victim. Mishnah, Shekelim, 7, 4. Got that one? The same rule, by the way, speaks of finding Passover offerings within 30 days of the feast, i.e. in February, since flocks might be thus in the field in winter, 
the traditional date of our Lord's birth, December 25th, is not ruled out. But of course, that's highly debated. And in fact, uh, our Lord was born probably before 4 BC, not 1 AD, because he was born on the reign of Herod the Great. And Herod the Great died in 4 BC, before Christ. So most scholars believe is around 7, 6, 5, 4, somewhere in there that our Lord was born. This is really a, an interesting thing when we begin to learn it. And here are these shepherds, and they're in the field. Look at verse 9. It says, And lo, are suddenly an angel of the Lord, an angel, stood before them. This is likely Gabriel, who spoke to Mary and announced the birth of our Lord. Very possibly to others, to Joseph. And here's a, an angel suddenly stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around about them. And they were sore afraid, the King James says. That means they were flat scared. They were terrified. They had never seen this before. I can imagine they were frozen. Wouldn't you be? With fear. Because of this angelic being. By the way, we got an angel up there. That's the best I could do. Because angels don't have wings, as you know. With the exception of the cherubim and the seraphim. The cherubim have four. The seraphim have six. But angels don't have wings. The Middle Ages put wings on all the angels. You know why? Because zip flash and they were there. And they had to have speed to do that. But here is a male angel. And by the way, some things about angel just in passing. Angelos means messenger, angel. They are messengers. Hebrews 1.14 says, Are not they all sent forth as ministering spirits to minister to those of us who are heirs of salvation? So they minister to us, angels. Here's some facts. They're always masculine in the Bible. Don't tell it to the now people. Don't tell it to the liberation of women, don't tell any of those folks. They're always men. See if you can find one of men. I, I looked till I was blue in the face to find a man, male, angel. Angels are always masculine in the Bible, never female. Angels have no wings in the Bible, with two exceptions. There are categories of angels. There are holy angels and there are fallen angels that we know as demons. And humans do not become angels when they die, don't wait for that time. You'll never become an angel. They're a separate creation from humans. And he has placed man a little below the angels and crowned him with glory. God created an innumerable number. That means there are not millions, billions, or trillions. It is innumerable. You can't count the number of angels, and guess what? They are all ministering spirits to us. Uh, God doesn't lack angels to help, to lead, to guide, whatever he wants them to do, he does. Uh, they're a separate creation from man. They're highly organized. They do not increase or decrease. And by the way, the Bible never instructs a believer to make contact with an angel. In fact, folks who are making contact with angels today, unfortunately, don't understand that there are two kinds of angels. There are holy angels, and there are fallen angels that would not lead you where God would want you to go. So that's verse 9, uh, angels. And they gave some good news, and this is what it is. I bring you glad tidings, the angel said. And glad tidings is a word in the Greek. It's euangelia. Euangelia, and it's evangelize. This is truth to evangelize, truth to give the world. I bring you good news of glad tidings, which will be to all the world. Salvation brings great joy. Notice this verse again. For behold, I bring you glad tidings. This is verse 10. 
that is good news about the good news of great joy. Christmas is all about joy because we know that God has made a way for us. God has made a deliverance for us. He has sent a deliverer who not only delivers us from hell, but delivers us from sin and delivers us from our difficult times. He delivers us. He's our, have you called on your deliverer today? Have you called on him this week? Call on him and he will answer you and show you great and mighty things. He's your savior. He's your deliverer. He's come to deliver you from whatever it is that plagues you. Whatever struggle that you are in. I know this for, from 65 years of knowing him. He is the answer. There's nothing that he can't do. There's no problem that he can't answer. He's there for you. He came into the world at this time of year to be our savior, to be our deliverer. Wow. I was just thinking about this yesterday because at this particular stage in my life, I think about my mortality quite often. You know, I'm hoping to start a Bible study here pretty soon, and I'm thinking, wow, how much time do I have? I need to do this quick, because I don't know, you know, from day to day. Let's get it going, get it on. And, um, and then I think, you know, my times are in his hands. So I don't have to worry about that. He's told me that. He's told all of us that in his word. Our times are in his hands. He guides, directs, determines. And um, so that's wonderful news. Christmas is a time of salvation, the message of salvation, of sins forgiven, and the joy that comes from that. And it's going to be to all people, he says here. That is, it's not to Jews alone. It's for everyone. There's a universal appeal in the gospel. And verse 11 says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ, Christos, Messiah, the Anointed One, the Lord. And this is the word kurios in the Greek. In the Old Testament, it referred to Yahweh. So he's saying, basically, and you might want to put this note down in your Bible, here is a strong argument for the deity of our Lord. He is the Messiah, he is the anointed one, and he's Yahweh. He is God. And that's what the angel is saying. Now, verse 12. <clears throat> and this shall be a sign to you. Now, you know there are some translations of the New Testament that leave out swaddling clothes here. That's a sign. You go to Bethlehem, and this is going to be a sign for the baby that you're looking for. He's going to be wrapped in swaddling clothes. He's going to be recognized by that. He's going to be laying in a food trough for animals. Now, I don't know. This may have been the first and last time that was ever done. How many of your moms are going to put your baby in a food trough for animals? Uh, that was a sign for these wise men, for these shepherds, I'm sorry. We haven't got to the wise men yet. The wise men are later. The wise men are months and months later. The wise men may even be a year or more later. They never saw the manger. They never met the shepherds. They never heard the announcement of the angels. They were another stage in the story altogether. Now, I know this messes up your manger scene, but I'm sorry. You just gotta have to mess it up, you know. Take the kings out of there. They weren't kings anyway. We three kings of Orient. They weren't three. They weren't kings. They weren't of the Orient. Our carols just really simply mess us up sometimes. And we've met, I mean, how is this going? You know, we, we've sung some this morning, unfortunately, that I'm contradicting right and left. But it's good to be able to know what's what, isn't it? And to know what the Word of God says and what our Christmas carols. And I don't say much about Christmas cards anymore because I don't get any, but <laughs> Christmas cards really 
will mess you up. Christmas card theology is the worst theology. If you ever get one that is in a card with the Bible, frame it and uh, bring it to me and, and I'll, I will keep it sacred. So verse 12, this shall be a sign unto you. It's going to be a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, tightly wrapped in a manger, in a livestock feeding trough. Verse 13, and suddenly there was with the angel, a multitude, a crowd, a heavenly host. And this word host is a military term. It means an army, the armies of heaven. How many is that? Well, innumerable. We don't know how many there were. A crowd, an army announcing peace. You ever heard of an army doing that? An army announcing peace. And here again is the message of Christmas. Praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. Christmas should be a time for praising God, you know. And that's what we've done this morning. We should do this in our homes. We should do this all the time, every day, every month, every year. But Christmas especially reminds us that he is to be praised. There's to be rejoicing in our salvation. What he's done for us. There's to be thankfulness for how he lived and how he died. How he hum humiliated himself for us. So, glory to God in the highest. This is verse 14. On earth peace Goodwill toward men. Now here's another problem. This is a mistranslation. It's better understood to say peace for you. Peace among men in whom he is well pleased. That's a literal translation. What that means is that God has come to give you peace, not the world. But he's come to give you peace. And if you don't have that this morning, it's there for you. Because he promised it to us. Let me read his promise, John 14, 27. And Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. You believe in God, believe also in me. And he goes on with promise after promise. And so look, this is the promise that our Lord has made to us. Do you have that this morning? Peace that passes understanding. Not only that, notice what he says. Peace I leave with you. My peace. That's the peace that took him to the cross. That's the peace that held him there. That's the peace he offers you. Wow. That's a wonderful peace. I don't know about you and probably not most of you, but some of us have been very close to death maybe a number of times. And there is the peace that passes all understanding that he gives at that time. And I know Alan Harris could share that with you. And many of you could share that, the peace that God gives you when uh, there is real difficulty and he will give it to all of us because he promised that he would. Now, moving on. Months, possibly as much as a year or more, the wise men finally reach. Not the stable, not the manger, but a house in Bethlehem. So look at Matthew chapter 2 for their story. Matthew chapter 2. Now, after Jesus was born, and your King James has when, but this is not actually when. This is long after the Lord Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. 
In the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, not in Bethlehem, they came to Jerusalem first. Why did they come to Jerusalem? Because that's where a king would be of any people in the capital city. And so they came from the east to Jerusalem. They had seen his star when they were in the east. The star wasn't in the east. But when they were in the east, they saw the star. And they still had to travel 900 plus miles. And if you, you, if you went uh, the, the way a bird flies, I think. It was much further. And unless, uh, if they went, we don't know if they went on foot. Uh, we think they didn't go on camels because we're sure these people were from Persia. What did Persians uh, favor? Horses, yeah, they, uh, camels they wouldn't even use for luggage. So about it, your Christmas cards again. Uh, and about these wise men. Um, they came to present their gifts to the newborn king. So this first verse, now when Jesus was born or after he was born, literally, Jesus having been born. It's an aorist participle in the Greek. It means the past. Jesus was born back there when the, when the shepherds saw him a long time ago. That's when he was born, and now these magi are there, wise men in Bethlehem. I, I, I just go on and on about when he was born here but we don't want to do that. Um, but again, you know, we need to get out of our minds the shepherds and the wise men and the manger and the star above the manger. And, you know, the shepherds never saw the star. They wouldn't have known what to do with it. And the wise men didn't see the angels. It's all at a different time. In fact, unless, unless there was mass transit or air, there wasn't any way that the wise men could have gotten there. Just no way. It took them months. Literally now when Jesus or having been born, in the days of Herod the king, let's talk about Herod, Herod the Great. Herod was half Jew and half Edomian. The Jewish people hated him. He was ruled, ruler there for 43 years. He was a great builder, and we saw some of the things that he built when we were in Jerusalem. Very interesting things. He had a tremendous ego. He was paranoid that someone might try to take his throne. He murdered his favorite wife, Mary Amney, and her two sons, his two sons. He killed every, every one who indicated they might desire his throne. When he came to power, he murdered 300 Jewish officials, court officials. When we think about that as horrible. Then we think about Kim Jong-un who has killed hundreds since he came to power. And interesting enough, I was looking at this on, on that wonderful, helpful website, YouTubes and all that. He killed his uncle and his family. He killed the ambassador to Cuba. He murdered all kinds of people and army officials with Flamethrowers, that's how he murdered some of them. Others, with other means that you don't want to know about. So it's not so different from the world we live in. In fact, the world we're living in is reverting to a time as bad or worse than that. So. When he was dying, by the way, he knew everyone hated him. So he had all the Jewish leaders rounded up and murdered. He murdered the whole Sanhedrin. He murdered them so that someone would weep when he died. This man was a maniac. Um, in fact, uh, Augustine said he had rather be his pig than his son, Herod's. Big. So the wise men have come now from the east to Jerusalem. 
This is a, a word magi, or magoi, plural, wise men. It was a group of men from Persia. And by the way, you can read this in your encyclopedia. Uh, they were from the east. This is the word apo anatolon, which means from the rising. Literally, the rising of the sun. You know, the, the Chinese have a rising sun for their flag. From the east, from that direction, from Persia. Um, so there are all kind of theories as to what the star was. I can't even get into all of that, but it's so interesting. I don't know. There's, oh, yeah. And the catacombs. These guys are dressed in Persian dress. They have capes. They have conical hats. They have tights of a sort on. They're dressed as Persians. So they do this in the catacombs. They put these frescoes in all the churches. Uh, these are paintings in particular in the catacombs. Um, the term Magi is a Persian Syriac term. Uh, the church fathers believed they were from Persia. But here's something I found that I hadn't found before. I'll bore you with. They found in China a very interesting obelisk or monument. And in fact, uh, in 1625, there were some Chinese workers digging a foundation to a house uh, in the city of Sinagal, Fao, in the province of what Chinsi in the province of Chinsi. Now, y'all look that up on your map, and you'll know about where this was. They were digging, and they unearthed this large monument, stone monument. Uh, it was dark marble, and on one side, it was 10 feet tall, 5 feet wide. One side was all Chinese characters writing. The other side was unknown language. Later on, it was determined that that was Syriac, and it was a result of Nestronian missionaries who came to China in the 7th century, that is in the 600s. Very early, China heard the gospel. And on that obelisk, it tells all about the creation, the coming of Messiah, the birth of Jesus. And here's a phrase that I just wanted to read to you I thought was interesting. The, the Messiah, then the Messiah appeared, it says, announced by constellations. I thought that was interesting. So we think, was it a comet? Was it a nova? Was it a supernova? Was it a, a conjunction of planets, particularly Saturn and Jupiter in the constellation Pisces? Because Jupiter is the planet for kings and Saturn for, I forget, and Pisces, a constellation for Israel. And there was a constellation, there was a conjunction there in 7 BC, 7 BC. Could it be that that was, well, I don't know. Others say it was the Shekinah glory. Doesn't work. Persians wouldn't have known what that was. Others say it was a special star. Let me tell you what I believe, for what it's worth. I believe that there was a conjunction of planets. Uh, Johannes Kepler talked about this, that alerted the wise men. But once they got to Jerusalem, it alerted the wise men to the fact that there would be a king born in Israel. They went to Jerusalem and were told where the king would be born in Bethlehem. They left Jerusalem, guess what? They saw the star again. It wasn't the conjunction again. It was a supernatural star that led them, that stood over the place where the young child was. So it was a, it was a supernatural star that could do whatever it needed to do. So that's my take on it, whatever. Anyway, this is what it said. The joy of his birth, this is in Chinese, Announced by constellations, the Persians saw the splendor and ran to pay homage. So way back in the 600s, the Persians were the ones who were identified as the wise men. Now, why would wise men from Persia be interested in a Jewish king? Well, because Nebuchadnezzar took captive all the royalties 
in Judea, you remember, very early, 600 years before this occurred. But guess what? Daniel became the president of the Magi. He became the president of the Chaldeans. He not only become their, became their president, but he, no doubt he instilled in them all the prophecies of Israel and all the things that were... The book of Daniel, you know, it's written partly in Chaldean. Why would that be? Because that's where he was. Uh, very interesting things that we begin to see when we read the story of the wise men and the stories of the shepherds in the Bible and what they really say. Now, I'm way off here. Where am I? See, I'm, I'm skipping pages and I'm... Okay. How about verse 2? Is that close? <laughs> we are come to worship him. Christmas is about worship. And it should be about worship. And this season of the year should be... Are you worshiping in your home? Are you worshiping the Lord Jesus at your Christmas celebration? One year I remember when our girls were very little, we had for our Christmas tree a manger scene. And we had them put all their dolls around the manger scene. And we attempted to make it a meaningful time and centering on him. That's what Christmas ought to be. We ought to focus on him not his mother. The shepherds focused on Jesus. So Christmas should be a time of worship, and they came to worship him. After all, it's his birthday, isn't it? What gifts have you planned to give him this Christmas? Have you thought about that? How about time? What kind of gift will you give Jesus? That ought to be something to think about. What am I going to give him? It's not so much giving gifts to one another. By the way, our family has grown, increased so much. Gifts have become a thing of the past, basically. We have stocking stuffers, stuffers sometime, you know? Everybody has a stocking, and they put in what they can. And this year, I think we're, we're giving to the planet something else. What is it? Giving to, we're talking about giving gifts to people who need it and not to one another. But what gift are you giving to Jesus this year? Uh, time, money, your life? It's his birthday. Verse 3 Herod heard about these foreigners the Persians. He heard about the star and he heard about a rival for his throne. And notice this verse 3, it says, and he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And the word means agitated in turmoil. Now let me tell you, surely they were not in turmoil for three wobbly little old senile men coming up to the gate. You reckon? Because Persians, and particularly these royal Persians, as they were, their history, they were escorted. And by the way, it's interesting that at this time, Rome's arch enemy was Persia. And now we have a Persian army at the gate of Jerusalem. An escort that had been said to be hundreds and even thousands who escorted these people. No wonder it took so many months to get there. But I think more than three, we get the idea that there were three, right, from the three gifts. But you know, the history tells us that the Syrians said 14, others said there were 28 wise men, one of the numbers is 12 wise men, and we came to a simple conclusion. There were three, and we've got them named. Actually, one's from India, one's from the continents, you know, and they've got those particular names. And every culture has them named in their own culture. And some say they represented Ham, Shem, and Japheth, the sons of Noah. And we've got all kind of ideas. Let me say, no, 
<laughs> that wasn't it. There were a lot of Persian aristocrats who were interested in astronomy, who saw the signs and the planets, and who began to prepare to make a long journey all the way to Jerusalem, all the way to Bethlehem. But Herod, hearing this, wanted him out of the picture. And you know, people are like that today. They want him out of the picture. They don't want him disturbing their lives. There are government officials like that. There are people in administration, in our education system. There are people all over who don't want him in any way, shape, or form. They want him out. And that's the way Herod the Great felt. He was a rival for his throne. So Herod becomes an example of someone knowing all about him, knowing the prophecy of his birth, knowing that he had come to be the savior of the king and wanting nothing to do with him. They wanted him dead. So you can reject him, but it will ruin your life and you will lose your soul. Now verse 6, and we've got to go right quick. Verse 6. These leaders in Bethlehem, the priests, or in Jerusalem, the priests and the scribes, the religious leaders of our Lord's day, knew exactly what the prophets said, knew exactly where the Lord Jesus would be born. They took no time at all. They were not interested in his birth. They told the wise men, here's what the Bible says. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. He's a tender shepherd, the Lord Jesus. And then Herod secretly called the wise men and he interrogated them. Where? When? When did you see the star? Where is he going to be born? What month? What day? What year? Verse 16 tells us something about this. It tells us about the interrogation and the results of it. He killed every baby in Bethlehem and in the area that was two years and under according to when the wise men had seen the star. He wasn't taking any chances. I don't think it was two years but I think it probably was a long time, and he wasn't taking any chances. He killed every boar baby, two years and under. That's a harsh thing for us to think about. And verse 8 is very important, the Greek words here, look at them. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, not a babe. This is the word paideon in the Greek, and it means a toddler, a child. In Luke, the word for babe is brephos, one on the breast. It's an infant, a newborn. But here, they're going to see a child, a toddler now. He's a toddler by now. We had the pic, oh yeah, I love that picture. That's when the wise men saw him. When he was a little child toddling around. And when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. Yeah, right. Verse 9, after hearing the king, they went their way, and I'm sure determining to find the Lord and bring back news to Herod. And the star which they had seen in the east went before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. It kind of mars my theory, but it's the same star evidently that they saw when they were in the east. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced. Now let me say this again. Christmas is a time for rejoicing. It's the end of your search. You've found the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And it's a time for rejoicing. Your sins have been forgiven. Your sins have been washed away. Rejoice over that. Verse 11, after coming into the house, now look at this. Not manger, right? Oikos. 
not phaetonae, but oikos. They came into the house where the child was with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him, not Mary, but the Lord Jesus Christ. They worshipped him, and that's the reason for Christmas. That's what Christmas should be about, not elevating people, but elevating him, praising him, rejoicing in him, giving gifts to him, thanking him. They fell on their faces and they worshiped him. How do you do that? You, can, you know, what's your definition of worshiping him? You worship him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. By the way, mind comes in there, means you've got to think, means you've got to study, you've got to read God's word. That's what Christmas is all about. And then verse 11 says, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country another way. So verse 9, 10, and 11 in my notes here somewhere, they saw the young child and they worship him. What are some lessons that we can learn from this? We could talk about the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. These were valuable things. Frankincense was valuable. And a gold, of course, a gift for kings. But here's a lesson. How often do we celebrate his birth and miss him? How often the scribes, the Pharisees, the chief priests, the religious people of the day celebrated Christmas. Our world is celebrating Christmas. But they're missing him. We don't want to do that this year. Christ should be the center of our celebration. We should celebrate him. So this morning, it may be that there's someone here who has never fallen at his feet, trusted him and him alone for their salvation. Well, you can do that this morning, right here in the quietness of your heart. You can accept, you can believe, you can trust, you can receive the Christ of Christmas and be changed, be given eternal life. The chief priests, the scribes, are examples for us not to follow. Unless a star leads you to Christ, it's a wrong star. Unless an angel leads you to Christ, it's a wrong angel. So I want you to bow your heads, if you will, with me just now. And let me invite you, if you're here, and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, let me invite you in the quietness of your heart to say to him something like this, Lord Jesus, I want you as my Savior. I want your forgiveness. I want to know you. You make that your prayer to him or something like that and his promise to come into you and to save you and to forgive you of your sins. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If your burden is too heavy this morning, your labor is too hard, trust him and he will give you rest. Rest for your soul. And you can do that now. Father, we pray just now that you will speak to that one who you have been waiting for. That you will assure them of your presence and your love and your forgiveness because of what the Savior did 
when he became our substitute, paid the penalty for our sins on the cross. We pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. Now we want to remember him uh, in these elements.